Microphone on. Can you hear me? Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the Communications and Technology Committee. Um, as was stated, I will try and keep this down to three minutes, but I have also distributed a longer written statement that provides further legal support for the comments that I am about to make, as well as further quotes from other experts on this matter. HB 5973 has two key reasons that I seek to oppose it today. First, it undermines emerging competition in the marketplace and would disadvantage new social media startups, including platforms focused on specific communities, such as those seeking to serve conservatives or to serve, say, members of the LGBTQ community. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, it violates the First Amendment as multiple federal courts have held regarding similar state laws. So to begin with, HB 5973 undercuts competition and disadvantages these new platforms. While it may only currently apply to platforms with 50 million users, we've seen new competitors emerge all the time when they found a new audience to serve. That means that a platform that many of us may have never heard of a year ago can suddenly become the next big thing with young people particularly. We've seen this happen time and time again. I'm a millennial and I joke that now sometimes I feel out of date because the platforms that I remember being new, hip, and cool aren't as cool with my younger Gen Z cousins. They're on completely different platforms. At the same time, we've seen that this continued dynamic innovation often provides us new solutions, new ways to connect with each other, new information that we could have never imagined. I do have significant concerns about the limitations for content moderation within HB 5973. Notably, the proposal limits the ability to remove content directed at a group on the basis of race, color, disability, religion, national origin, or ancestry, age, sex, or status as a peace officer or judge, only to incidents where it includes incitement to criminal activity or consists of specific threats of violence. Additionally, this under HB 5973, there would not be the type of removals that many of us find make it easier for us to use the internet and makes it a more enjoyable place. Notably, YouTube would be unable to prevent children from accessing user posted videos with violent, hateful, or racist content that is inappropriate for children, even in homes where parents activate restricted mode specifically to protect their children from such content. Al Jazeera and Russia today could sue social media platforms for restricting posts that celebrate terrorist activities or for spreading foreign pro propaganda. And social media platforms would be uncertain if they were able to respond to or remove spam messages that did not fall into one of those categories. Second key point I would like to make is that HB 5973 violates the First Amendment. I've provided two key examples from the litigation that NetChoice, where I serve as policy counsel, is currently involved in, NetChoice v. Paxton and NetChoice v. Moody. As was mentioned earlier, many key elements of HB 57, I'm sorry, 5973 mirror the HB 20 in Texas that was previously enjoined. While that injunction was initially removed by the Fifth Circuit, that court did not rule on the underlying merits of the case. And as was mentioned earlier by Professor Kandub, we are currently have pending emergency action at the Supreme Court regarding the removal of that injunction. But there are a few key reasons why HB 5973 should still be a concern when it comes to potential First Amendment violations. First, it arbitrarily targets politically disfavored platforms for special burdens. This regards the size requirements and the fact that this is only targeting a certain category of internet platforms. Second, HB 5973 is premised on social media businesses being common carriers but they're not and cannot simply be declared so by the state. Further, even if they were common carriers, they still have First Amendment rights when it comes to some of the things in question. Finally, HB 5973 discriminates on the basis of content and viewpoint and would not survive strict scrutiny in the courts. And finally, because it triggers that strict scrutiny test by being government action into speech, it would then flunk it meaning that it would likely, if it would almost certainly be struck down in the courts as violating the First Amendment. To conclude, HB 5973 violates the key values of limited governments and free markets. 
In 1987, President Ronald Reagan repealed the infamous Fairness Doctrine, which required equal treatment of political views by broadcasters, saying, this type of content-based regulation by federal government is antagonistic to the freedom of expression guaranteed by the First Amendment. In any other medium besides broadcasting, such federal policing would be unthinkable. Today, we face similar unthinkable restrictions as HB 5970, as in proposals such as HB 5973, when we see state governments seek to punish private platforms for moderating their services in ways that they see fit for their customer base and advertisers. But we as citizens are the ones who ultimately bear the concerning consequences of such proposals as they negatively impact both existing and emerging opportunities for speech and connection. The opportunities for speech have never been stronger. No longer are voices limited to a handful of newspapers and networks where those in power can decide if alternative viewpoints or marginalized voices can speak. Now the average user can reach billions of people across multiple social media platforms to find the one that best suits their needs, including not only Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, but newer, more specific platforms such as Rumble, Gitter, or former President Donald Trump's own True Social. Social networks have allowed users to easily find and connect with communities of shared interest. Nevertheless, we, nevertheless, we've seen some on both the right and the left proposing the government regulate social networks' efforts to remove objectionable content, but often for completely dichotomous reasons. The reality remains that online content moderation often entails many decisions that are far from black and white and that government intervention not only violates the free market principles, but makes these underlying difficult decisions far more difficult. Net choice supports limited government, free markets, and adherence to the United States Constitution. So with that, we respectfully ask that you oppose HB 5973, and I welcome your questions. I would just make a comment that um, even like with political candidates, there is, a, you know, on the radio, there is an equal time law. So if one candidate gets, you know, X amount of time, um, their opposition gets that. I mean, so how would you say that we're not putting parameters around speech when we do have these laws? I was referencing the previously held Fairness Doctrine, Madam Chair, under the FCC, which was removed um, under the Reagan administration. Um, and what we saw is that the removal of that allowed the growth of a lot of new content on the radio particularly. In fact, the removal of the Fairness Doctrine is largely credited with the emergence of um, conservative talk radio particularly. Um, and so if we're looking to impose similar burdens on online platforms, we're likely to see an elimination of, of speech online um, in, rather than a further flourishing of it in ways that would particularly make it more difficult for um, platforms that are trying to function for specific communities. So a platform that wants to have rules in accordance with you know, a certain set of, of religious values or a platform that wants to make sure that those of um, the LGBTQ orientation are comfortable there, or a platform that wanted to give conservative voices that it felt was being underserved an opportunity. Okay. Representative Houck? So then would you support that the people that own the servers would not be able to shut these social media places down? Are, are you referencing net neutrality or are you referencing... I'm representing, say, Morton. Amazon all of a sudden finds they don't like what one of these social media platforms are doing and they sh take their server away from them. Madam Chair, Mr. Representative, I think that this gets into a lot of complicated questions around private business contracts. And I think we need to be concerned about the government interfering in the decisions of those private businesses. We as individuals may not like the decision that a private business makes and we may think it's a bad decision but even in the case of say servers or cloud computing there are a lot of different options out there in the market and these are often highly negotiated business contracts and i would be concerned about the government dictating the specifics of the contracts that pr to private businesses but didn't you just punted the issue right i mean you're concerned about us limiting speech on individuals on a public platform but it's okay for one business to tell one of these public platforms, no, we don't like the content you're doing, so we're going to pull you? 
Uh, Mr. Representative, if I could clarify, I consider these platforms private businesses as well, not public. But we have to look at this a little bit different than, a, say, a mom and pop store, a Walmart, a Myers, because there's only, what, four servers that handle the majority of all the public platforms in the United States, right? You got Amazon, you got Apple, you have Google. Who else am I? I'm there are, there are emerging cloud computing providers, Mr. Representative, including some that are seeking to specifically, say, serve conservative. Um, but are they, are they going right now? Or are they at the size and capacity? And, and the other deal is, is Apple and Google, if you don't use them, you cannot have an app on your phone, so you cannot use the platform. So I think it's a little disingenuous to say that we can't get involved between a business and a business when that business has a monopoly on what they provide. So, Mr. Representative, I would suggest that this would actually make it more difficult for new players to enter that market if you are concerned about the concentration in that market. I would be happy to have further conversations on some of the debates around antitrust, but I would point out that even in the app store market, there are many other competitors. Um, if you look at things like Samsung's app store or things like that, but that's not necessarily relevant to this particular bill. I, I would have to disagree with that, but we can continue. <laughs> Representative Bazat. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your testimony. You, you said these are private platforms, but weren't they built on uh, grants, public grants, public money, incentives, the majority of the money that goes to build these platforms? So why shouldn't we, we oversee it in the public's interest? Are, are you referencing Facebook. They were built as private businesses. They private businesses with public money, incentives, no. grants. Facebook was not built with grants that I am aware of. How about the other platforms? I would, I would have to get back to you, but not that, that I am aware of were these created by government grants in any form. Quick question. Yeah. Representative Very quick. That's a really good question. But these companies are using internet lines that were provided by public dollars, correct? I mean, that's obvious. The, the Facebook didn't plant its own fiber optic network, as far as I understand. Is that correct? I am not uh, aware of the the exact nature of that, so I would I would ask to get back to you. But interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I haven't thought of that. Thank you. We appreciate your testimony. Um, okay, we're going to keep this moving. Uh, Mr. James Shirk, Director of the Center for America Freedom at the America First